Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us on this lovely overcast evening. Um, so, as mentioned, I'll be talking about um, the biopsychosocial lens through the view of sickle cell disease. Um, so, the title I'll just read it to you Viewing Sickle Cell Disease Through a Biopsychosocial Lens. The role of psychological and behavioral factors on the pain experience. And so, to begin this talk, um, I'd just like to reference all of this discussion through a patient that I became familiar with, you know, a few years ago when I was at Oregon Health and Science University during my anesthesia residency. We had a pain service in the hospital, and this gentleman who I'm going to talk to you about is uh, one of the patients that would you know, come to the emergency department every, every so often. So I find it helpful to discuss concepts, you know, when it's related to a person or, you know, if there's some kind of situation to really grab onto, because otherwise it just feels like words in a void. So our person is um, a young man in his early 20s, and he, when he was very young, was diagnosed with sickle cell disease. And for those uh, who may be unfamiliar with what this condition is, it is a disease that affects, you know, your red blood cells, the production of them. So red blood cells normally are circle or oval in shape, and that allows them to pass through blood vessels without much difficulty assuming nothing else is happening. But uh, with sickle cell disease, the red blood cells, you know, can take on the shape of little sickles or crescent moon shapes. And this matters because when they're in that shape, they can get stuck in blood vessels. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when they get stuck in blood vessels, you know, blood can't really flow past it very easily. So blood flow gets interrupted. And this matters because it can lead to really bad pain symptoms. And people with this condition will have pain flares um, where their blood vessels are clogged with these sickle cells. And not only do they have pain flares, they also have to deal with chronic pain from repeated episodes of this. And so, this person was dealing with such a condition in his early 20s had dealt with many of these pain flares had gone to the emergency departments often had been admitted to the hospital to try to deal with this often and in the course of this he developed chronic pain in his back his knees and his hips now when i met him the first time he was pretty quiet reserved didn't make eye contact, didn't really want to engage with any of the medical professionals. And, you know, just in looking at him, I wondered, you know, if he was also having to deal with depression, anxiety, stress. And, you know, a question that can come up is, why do I care about his mental health when he's here for pain? That's what this whole discussion is going to be about. And I just also like to offer that it's not just, you know, sickle cell disease that this applies to. It's any chronic condition that can lead to, you know, chronic pain, such as fibromyalgia or migraine or injuries or what have you. Anything that can lead to chronic pain, this also applies. But we're just viewing it through the lens of sickle cell disease. So... Let's get into the nuts and bolts of this a little bit. And we'll start by, you know, asking a rather annoying question. What is pain? So the medical definition that we work with, you know, we as providers and medical professionals, is this mouthful of a definition. An unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. Now, this is a very um, technical way of describing that 
pain has more than just the component of, you know, the ouch sensation. I have um, underlined and bolded the word experience because apart from just like the sensory, the ouch, you know, there's also an emotional component. And so you can see that pain isn't just physical. And uh, this matters because experiences vary from person to person. No one person has the same experience. Therefore, no one or two or however many people are going to have the same pain experience. That's something we're going to keep in mind as we move on. And so this slide is just really expanding on that idea just, you know, a little bit further. So again, pain is not a one size fits all sensation. We have a, a child, you know, a little human, if you will, wearing a suit. Suits are made for humans, but not all suits fit all humans, right? There are different variations, there are different sizes, different heights, different everything. And so what a person feels depends on more than one factor, depends on many factors. And one of the most important is mental health. So in order to get a better understanding of where the pain is coming from and therefore how best to manage it, it's incredibly important to really know the person that you're treating, you know them beyond just the superficial. And to really drive that point home, you know, assumptions can be problematic. It can, it can be it can be harmful, you know, not just to the patients, but you know, to the to the caretakers as well. And there are several quotes, several statements that I've personally heard myself over the years, uh, and things that patients have told me, and a couple of them go as follows. You know, th this isn't that bad. I don't know why this is hurting you this much, or I've been something through this. You know, I've been I've been through something like this before. Or I've been through the exact same thing before, and it wasn't that bad for me. So why is it this bad for you? You know, and that those 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 kinds of statements really illustrate you know that the difference between pain experiences between people you know lies within their life experiences, you know what they have seen and dealt with in life or what they're currently dealing with, and how that frames what's going on with them right now. So let's let's get a little bit more into that. So mental health and chronic pain. There is a, you know, a, a very well-known association between chronic pain and mental health disorders that we're, we'll talk about in a little bit more detail uh, forthcoming. But specifically, chronic pain can and often does provoke uh, such things as depression and or anxiety. And because of that relationship, um, a cycle can be created in that, you know, you have an injury or you develop a condition that leads to longstanding pain. And I'll get more into this in, in the upcoming slides, but, you know, the pain starts to impact your day-to-day -day life, which can provoke the depression or the anxiety. And then this depression and anxiety can start to influence the degree of pain that you're feeling, specifically make it worse, which will then also fuel the depression and anxiety. And then you can see how we can get into this circle, if you will. So I'd just like to take a moment briefly here and circle back to our sickle cell patient. So again, he's coming in with the physical complaints of you know the pain in his back and his hips and his knees. And also remember that he's not really engaging with anybody. He's not really wanting to talk. And initially, you know, it's not uh, it's not seen as a flag. It's just something that is noted. But you know, now we're we're starting to get an understanding that it's worthwhile to investigate this. And again, this tight connection between mental health and, you know, the physical sensation of pain, not just, 
you know, specific to sickle cell disease. So why do we care about this cycle? So as I mentioned before, uh, long-standing pain can cause some pretty significant interference and sometimes, you know, this complete inhibition of regular everyday activities. So these activities can range from, you know, benign tasks that we don't even think about, such as going to the bathroom, you know, washing dishes or doing the chores that we all love to do, walking up and down stairs, if, you know, our homes have those such things, but, you know, can also range to how well you're able to do the things you like doing outside of the house, outside of the required things that you have to do, you know, such as sports or golf or spending time with friends and family or, you know, doing anything. And the other thing that can happen with, you know, long-standing pain is it can be really uncomfortable to do anything. And sometimes it can be really uncomfortable even when you're doing nothing at all. And as I mentioned, this leads to, this can, you know, this has the potential to lead to depression and anxiety, which can fuel that uh, cycle that I mentioned earlier. And so on this slide, you know, we have a couple of pictures here. I just kind of want to make a note of. So on the bottom, you know, there's a person sitting and, you know, the squiggles above their head and their mind is not at baseline, right? And so the, that's what that representation is meant to represent. And above it, we have, you know, a picture of nerves, like uh, neurons in the brain. And, you know, I want to mention that because to get a little bit technical for just a couple minutes here, both pain and depression within the brain, they utilize or they, they use um, the same chemicals to transmit signals to, you know, communicate messages within the brain. And those, uh, those signals that they use in common are dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline. And the reason I mentioned this is, you know, because pain and depression pathways have these things in common, you can imagine that if there's disruption in one, say the pain pathway, that's going to influence those neurotransmitters, the dopamine, the serotonin, and the norepinephrine. That's going to influence, you know, what is available or, you know, what is supplied to the pathway that would deal with depression. And so we can get an idea on a very technical and biochemical level that they are related, tied together, if you will. And I think that's probably about as technical as this conversation will get. But the key point here, um, biochemistry is involved, chemicals are involved that link both pain and depression together within the brain. So often you find them together. Now, to get a little bit more specific of the, the impacts of anxiety and depression on chronic pain, there's a couple of like uh, key things uh, that, I, that I tell all of my patients. You know, people who are living with chronic pain and depression often have more intense pain and more amplification of pain. And the way I describe that to, to my patients is, you know, if you can think of the nerves when they're in their ordinary state, they have a certain volume to them that is pretty, it's turned down pretty low until there's some kind of injury or something to cause you pain then they'll get turned up for a little bit. Now, with chronic pain, the volume is turned up very loudly all the time. And, you know, if you're musically inclined, it's kind of like having an amplifier. So the volume of the nerves is turned up. And you experience this as pain that's just always there, even though there's nothing actively happening to cause you the pain. 
So not only do people with chronic pain and depression have more intense pain and amplification of the pain, they also have longer duration of the pain. Um, and this also includes more pain complaints. And the more pain complaints, what I mean by that is every so often, you know, uh, pain will be felt like it's moving from one body part to another. And the way this is described by people who I'm talking to in clinic is, you know, one day the, the hip roll hurt them more. And then on a different day, the shoulder. And then a different day, like the wrist or the forearm. But it tends to migrate. And there's not always a great reasoning that the patients can think of as to why it's happening. So they have pain that started in one location, then it's kind of spread outward, if you will. And uh, the other thing that's pretty significant with chronic, with the anxiety rather on chronic pain is um, this idea that it will worsen post-surgical pain. This will require just a little bit of explaining, but um, prior to a person, you know, having a surgery for, you know, a broken leg or, or what have you, how they are before the surgery is going to really impact what their pain level is going to be after the surgery. So if before the surgery, the patient is feeling very anxious or terrified or uncomfortable or, or angry, if that isn't addressed, you know, it doesn't go away when they go back to the operating room and go to sleep and then wake up. And what happens is if they go to sleep like that, then the body is going to be in this like really revved up um, condition and we'll notice that in the operating room because you know the heart rate's going to be elevated the whole time the, the blood pressure is going to be elevated the whole time and these things are consistent with what we would see with you know pain and you know during the surgery again completely asleep and unaware of anything but actions of the surgery will cause you know greater responses in the vitals and the people who are really wrapped up before the surgery than those who weren't wrapped up. And then they will experience this as worse pain when they wake up from the surgery, even if it wasn't a very painful surgery to begin with. And so often if we notice that uh, prior to going back to the operating room, if we notice that someone is really wrapped up or amped up, we take the time to talk to them, you know, try to find out if there's anything that we can address that is making them nervous. And often it's just additional questions and answers or addressing the unknown situations. We can do that with conversation and we can also do that with medical management. But the point being that anxiety, if you know left unchecked, can also have the potential to make pain after surgery much worse. All this to say that uh, anxiety, depression, influence uh, pain symptoms quite a bit. So on this slide, diagnosing depression and anxiety and chronic pain, um, you see that I put there, you know, a misdiagnostic opportunity. And I put that there because, you know, the symptoms of depression and anxiety can be very similar to the pain. And Say that because the symptoms are, you know, they can be pretty broad. And these broad symptoms can include feelings of fatigue, insomnia, and pain in and of itself. Now, these things can also be felt with a person who's living with chronic pain and also dealing with fatigue just because they're not sleeping very well, insomnia because they're not sleeping very well from the pain, and then just the pain of wherever the source of the chronic pain is. And so this matters because when patients come to us and they report these symptoms, you know, patients sometimes just request treatment for the symptoms, thinking that it's only the pain that's causing these things. And providers, if we're not keyed in or, you know, thinking that there could be something going on, might, uh, you know, mistakenly only treat the pain. And the problem with that is only treating the physical symptoms does not guarantee that you're treating the whole. You know, it doesn't, doesn't guarantee that you're treating the potentially very significant cause 
which could be the anxiety or the depression. And the hazard of, you know, moving forward with medications or interventions without addressing mental health is complete lack of progress after you've done what you think was the appropriate measures. And then you might, you know, come across the saying down here, you should be feeling better by now. That's definitely something I have wondered myself, you know, earlier on in my training. And it can be a bit confusing, you know, if you're not really thinking about it. You know, we gave you a pain medication. How come you're still, how come the severity isn't much different? Or, you know, we gave you an intervention, we gave you an injection, and it doesn't seem like anything has really improved. So what did we miss? So just to once again, circle back to our patient with the sickle cell. He had been living with depression and, you know, that was a lot of, that was part of, you know, the presentation that we were seeing the, you know, unwillingness to really, <clears throat> the unwillingness to really talk with, you know, the medical professionals and the kind of downtrodden feel, the, um, the, 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 the flat affects that we call it. And so again, only treating the pain as it were right then would not have likely done everything that it could have done. And the other um, very significant mental health um, issue to bring, up, to bring up of chronic pain is post-traumatic stress disorder, because it also has a very strong relationship. And similar to depression and anxiety, so people who are dealing with PTSD and chronic pain are going to report, you know, worse pain severity than a person who doesn't have to live with that. And, um, you know, this is a pretty significant concern among the veteran population uh, in particular. They have been, been exposed to elements that, you know, non-veteran people have not been. But, you know, PTSD is, of course, not limited to the veteran population. It's limited. It also includes those who have suffered assaults, abuse, trauma, uh, refugees. And so it, it definitely, it's, it's, it's a, a very important avenue to explore. Um, if you have someone who you suspect has endured past trauma, because, again, if you you just go after the pain symptoms and you nothing is being done to address the mental health that is also you know coexisting and then you you probably won't make the desired amount of progress so you know with with all i've been saying about mental health and the pain experience and how that influences how much pain you know, a patient might feel, I just want to make sure that I can mention that it's not all in your head, but your head definitely is a major player. And that is something that I also try to stress with everyone that I see in the clinic in person or on a video visit. You know, when I'm talking to them and asking them, you know, about, about their pain and also how they are in life. And, you know, sometimes the question I get is, we, you know, I came to talk about my pain. I didn't come to talk about all of these things, I don't understand why that matters or why that's important. And I'm not crazy. And I'm absolutely not. You're most definitely not crazy. Your pain, I have reason to believe, is of course very real. But in order to treat it the best that we can, we also have to acknowledge that chronic pain is also doing things to to the mind and to the brain, and we have to address that too as a address everything as best as we can and you know acknowledgement by both the provider and the patient is going to lead to you know, the best outcome that we, that we can achieve and so let's go back to our sickle cell patient once once again here so you know, as I alluded to earlier, you know, there, his life has been pretty difficult up to this point, you know, with the, the chronic pain that his condition has 
you know, is causing him and, and the pain flares, you know, he's not able to do as much in his regular life as he was able to do a few years earlier. You know, he's formerly a basketball player, formerly played a lot of basketball. And that has become not, it's not an activity that he could really engage in anymore. You know, and just doing things around the house kind of gotten to be very, very uncomfortable to the point where he just doesn't want to do very much. And that has taken a toll on his mental health. You know, he's developed a lot of anxiety around this condition as well. You know, the, the anxiety stemming around, you know, when is the next pain flare going to happen? You know, if, if it does happen, when it does happen, will the treatment be enough to deal with it? And those are the two main things that was driving his anxiety. And then the other thing that required just a little bit of probing is the healthcare experiences that he had experienced in the past had been somewhat traumatizing. You know, he'd go to the emergency department and tell them about the, the amount of pain that he was in and he'd be, be, he would be met with disbelief or not being taken seriously. And that had led to him feeling defensive when talking to healthcare providers or healthcare professionals, defensive and irritable and preferring to say as little as he needed to. And so we have, you know, this gentleman living with a chronic pain, you know, with elements of depression, elements of anxiety, and maybe doesn't fit the diagnosis of PTSD, but still very much dealing with emotional trauma from trying to manage his condition. And so with all of our talking up to this point, you know, we can see that plenty of reason to have an increased pain experience, by any reason to have an increased sensation of pain, you know, more severe than if it were just the sickle cell disease itself. And again, this isn't just limited to, <clears throat> to sickle cell disease on its own. It applies to any long-standing condition that provokes pain, fibromyalgia, migraines, work injuries, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis. So now that I've just, you know, talked your ear off about the importance of mental health, well, what do we do? Where do we go from there? And so, you know, again, managing these patients is just not as straightforward as a medication or injecting as again, only adding a medication or only performing an injection or only doing some combination of the two and not addressing the whole may not be helpful, may not be significantly helpful. And in certain, in certain circumstances, it can just be worse. You can just make it worse if you don't address all of what's going on. The best treatment is when all of you is considered. Okay. And so where, where does that lead us to? Well, that leads us to the biopsychosocial approach to pain. And that is the approach that we utilize at Stanford to try to treat people to the absolute best that we can uh, who are living with chronic pain. And so here I'll read this uh, technical definition, but you know, it's biological, psychological, and social factors that can modulate a person's experience of chronic pain. And there's a word there that I just want to, you know, draw a lot of attention to, and that's the word modulate. Modulate is a you know, more technical term within medicine for influencing. And in this context, the biological, psychological, and social factors can influence a person's pain, a person's experience of chronic pain, that can, make, can either make it better or it can make it worse. Okay. Now, the, um, the Venn diagram off to the right here um, has some really helpful information in there. So um, my discussion up to this point has been 
a lot about the psychological aspect of it. You know, the mental health that's that's uh, noted down at the bottom there, but there's also the self-esteem. <clears throat> excuse me, the self-esteem, family relationships, social skills, and coping skills. I'd like to highlight the so the, the social skills and the, the coping skills in particular, because it's been my experience with both personal and with you know uh, helping out my my patients is we have this tendency to really overestimate our ability to socially cope or just to cope in general okay and then um, to go over the the other the other two aspects of this diagram so you know the biological which that's going to be you know things that are not incredibly within your control um, physical health you have some degree of control over that but not not 100%, not absolute control, you know, because there's genetic differences. Some are just predisposed to developing conditions more so than others, and that's not something that you can have a tremendous impact on. And this also goes with uh, medication effects. I mean, because of the genetic differences from person to person, a medication's impact on one person may be a little bit different um, on a uh, from person to person, and you tend to see that you know most often, or at least I tend to see it most often with opioid medications. Some people has have different processing of it, and some won't experience any benefit with one opioid, whereas one person, whereas another person will experience significant benefit with another with the same opioid. Okay, and then um, the other is the social, and that's going to be your friends your family, you know, family circumstances, friends' circumstances, relationships, <clears throat> all extraordinarily important. And then, you know, we can see that, you know, the interplay of all three of them is pretty tight and there's meeting in the middle there. And the thing to, to really, really drive home here is disruption of any one of these bubbles can lead to disruption in all of the bubbles. Disruption in any one of these can influence how much pain you're feeling. And then again, disruption of all of them, you can imagine, um, will have a negative impact on the pain that you're going to experience yourself. And that is also one of the things that, you know, I think is really wonderful about Stanford is that we try to take all of these things into account. And one of the main ways that we try to help out with the psychological <clears throat> and perhaps the social as well is engaging with our pain psychologists. Now, they are absolutely wonderful at helping you develop the coping skills and the social skills to help you um, try to reframe this pain that you're feeling. And again, as we were discussing the impact of one of these diagrams on on all of them you can you can imagine that you know adjusting the or uh, intervening on the psychological can and often does have impact on the social and the biological so therefore we try to take all of it into consideration and so just to really uh, to bring bring it back to our uh, patient from earlier, one one final time here. So, quick recap: uh, early twenties man living with sickle cell disease, and that has led to chronic pain of his uh, back, knees, and hips. Also having to deal with pain flares that come intermittently, and this has led to you know, through various experiences living with anxiety, depression, and emotional trauma. And so he needed more than just pain medications. He needed more than just injections. He needed to be treated for his pain in the, the context of the, the mental health troubles that he's also having to live with. And so when I first you know, met him, I sat down with him and I spoke to him for a while. You know, really heard his experience. 
And, you know, just in the 30 minutes or so that we were talking, the pain severity, you know, he said it was about eight to nine out of 10. That didn't change. But his pain, his, the tolerance of it did get just a little bit better. Right. And that is me with absolutely not at all an expert in this arena. This is, this is, this is not where my training lies, but just talking to me as, you know, a relatively lay person in this, in this field, he found some benefits. So you can imagine the kind of benefit that he might experience if he were able to engage with one of our psychologists, you know, our, our pain psychologist professionals who are extraordinarily well equipped to, to help sort, sort these things out. And so in an ideal world, we would have established him with somebody, but he ended up leaving the hospital before we could make that address. But the important thing is we had a plan we had we had framework for where to go from there in the event that he does come see us again. Because again, the pain that he's living with was one aspect, but the anxiety, the depression, and the emotional trauma was another. And they're both feeding each other and both are contributing to the pain that he was feeling. So before you know he left, we had talked about um, medication treatment and pursuing a pain psychologist, but again, he ended up leaving. But um, the idea was to get him established when he returned 